So, good evening to you once again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this last session of uh, discourses on Rumi. So far, we have spoken about love, about perennial philosophy in Rumi, about Fihemofi, discourses of Rumi, and tonight our topic is a little bit more technical, and I'm trying to avoid all uh, terminology, high terminology of science of letters, to communicate what I want to say about the art of Rumi rather than the tools of Rumi. We are going to serve a cup of beauty, intellectual beauty tonight, just as Shelley wrote him to intellectual beauty. This is Rumi's him to intellectual beauty. You know, in literary criticism, there are different schools. Some more common and fashionable of them are five approaches to literary criticism, which I want to choose one of these five and to linger a little bit on that. First is the moralistic approach. When they want to evaluate a work of literature or even art in general, sometimes they evaluate it according to morality, how far it is in harmony with the morality of the society, with the morality in general, uh, how are the characters, the ideas? That is moralistic approach. The second is psychological approach, more common and more appreciated by scholars, because the moralistic approach is often attributed to people who have certain uh, inclinations towards giving, interfering in everything with morality. And often they accuse or often they condemn certain books because of not being in harmony with morality, while it uh, has nothing to do with art. Art is beyond morality and immorality. Morality is uh, what the artist may use or may not use. But I'll tell you later that morality is an integrated part of all art without any intention on the part of the artist. The artist who tries to raise the level of morality of people is no great artist. But the artist, when he is doing the job, if he does it well, he helps finally because he creates beauty and beauty is the guide, is the star, the fixed star that guides you to morality, to all dignity and the nobility. The second, I said, is psychological approach. For example, when they analyze or discuss about Hamlet, they say, how is it that he hesitates? Why he hesitates? Whether something in Shakespeare has created this idea, what it has to do with Shakespeare, with the reign of truth, of course, in what they say. Um, all different schools have a reign of truth, uh, but they have something to say. But people who look from a higher horizon they can see all of them, that the psychology is right, 
sociology has its own share, form has its own share, and tonight we are going to speak about Rumi as far as the form of his poetry is concerned. And uh, some scholars believe that Rumi is a man of Sufism, a man of didactic poetry, a man of a master of mystical, theological, theosophical ideas, but he is not a master of art. He, when, he, when he comes to uh, word composition, he is careless and he is not, he has not created such great pieces of art like Hafiz or Saadi, who is the paragon of perfection in eloquence and beauty. I want to say it is not true. Rumi is a great artist and he is very careful, although he often <coughs> emphasizes that these forms I put away, I, am, I relieve myself from all these forms and this muftailon, 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 this is the rhythm, see, Kosht Mara is killing me, I, I want to put them all aside the rhyme and the rhythm and the words, everything, and I want to speak with my beloved without words, without sounds, and outside of all these uh, involvements. But at the same time, when he is calling to his beloved, to his Lord, he says, Khoshnishin, a kafiya andi shaman. I don't think about the rhyme, but you think about it. If you are drowned in, in the meaning, drowned in love, drowned in beauty, then whatever you say is musical, is harmonious, automatically, spontaneously. Rumi is, is not very careful to put this word or not that word, but the music comes with the idea. When the idea is bringing Rumi to dance, he is dancing and speaking and spontaneously composing poetry. Some people even believe that first comes the rhythm and then the ideas. He fills the, the rhythm with ideas. The start, you see sometimes um, if somebody is playing some uh, rhythm, is beating, uh, you may enter the circle and start dancing. Your dance fills in the rhythm because the rhythm is ready and you fill it with some melody. You, remit, you fill it with some ideas. You fill it with some meaning. You see, but uh, this is just like a container um, <coughs> empty and it is ready for someone to put the water of meaning or the wine of meaning or the wine of uh, beauty into it. So, <clears throat> at first I have to give an introduction to the idea of form. Form is one of the most common concepts in literature. It is so vast, actually hundreds and hundreds of books have to be written about form before you can understand something serious about that and to come to know what is what and it is very difficult to put people into picture when it comes to form because so many different sometimes contradictory meanings sometimes form is depreciated sometimes is appreciated form may be God according to Aristotelian philosophy form is the unity in everything everything which has a form the form of it is different from the matter of it. For example, a pitcher, a goblet, a cup. A cup is a form. The matter is not important. And the form is what gives unity and personality to a composition of material um, things. When uh, you speak of form, you speak of eternal realities, you speak finally of God, because God is the absolute form. 
everything has some potentialities and some actualities. The actuality is the form. The potentiality is the matter. So the more you have actuality, you are farther from matter. Un until you come to God. God is full actuality and uh, no, nothing in him to, be, to come from potentiality to actuality. He is full, perfect, and he is waiting nothing. This is one view. From another point of view, form, you say, what is this form? You have to go to meaning. Rumi, Rumi says, Yare ma'na shok surat rahdanas. Be a friend with the meaning. Because these forms are robbers, are thieves. These forms um, take you astray, misguide you. Because uh, forms may be may look the same, but the meaning far, far different. And uh, one of the greatest deceptions in the world, Rumi says, one of the greatest de deceptions done by all imposters and charlatans and uh, people who uh, deceive and try to uh, rob people of their uh, wealth, they all are misguiding people or misguiding people, misleading people by form. So let us read one story, uh, the story of the parrot, and then we'll go back to other meanings of form. There was a grocer who had a parrot, a sweet-voiced, green-talking parrot. Perched on the bench, it would watch over the shop in its master's absence and talk to the customers. Once as it sprang, it sprang from the bench. Of course, he has a little bit have reached it, the translator, but there are some other lines that once it happened that um, the grocer had gone home, and when he came back, a cat sprang from the bench and flew away. It has spilled some bottles of rose, rose oil. Its master came from his house and merchant's wise seated himself at ease on the bench, finding the bench wet with oil and his clothes greasy, he smote the parrot on the head and it was made the bald by the blow. For some few days, it refrained from a speech. The grocer, repenting, heaved deep sighs and tore his beard, saying, Alas, the sun of my prosperity is gone under the cloud. Would that my hand had been broken when I struck such a blow on the head of the sweet-tongued one. He was giving presents to every dervish that he might get back to the speech of his bird, the speech of his bird. After three days and nights, he was seated on the bench, distraught and sorrowful like a man in, dis in despair, showing the bird every sort of marvels in the hope that maybe it would begin to speak. It would begin to speak. When a bareheaded dervish passed by, a bareheaded dervish like me, <laughs> with bald head, passed by, clad in jola, clad in, in rags, in, in Sufi dress, his head hairless at the outside of the bowl. Thereupon the parrot began to talk. Suddenly the parrot started talking, oh, you, how did you come become bald? Is it true that you have also spilled oil, <laughs> the, the oil on the table? Thereupon the parrot began to talk, screech at the dervish and said, Hey fellow, how were you mixed up with the ball, oh ball pate? 
Did you then spill oil from the bottle? The bystanders laughed at the parrot's inference because it deemed the wearer of the frock to be like itself. You see, so Rumi goes on to say that thousands and thousands and thousands of people are misguided and misled by these um, similarity of forms because um, uh, people in religion say what is he is a religious man he is a, what is the meaning of he is a religious man there are certain forms and the forms can be assumed by anybody everybody can have can follow certain forms so he deceives you that I am a man of God while a man of God has no form no particular dress. Some people have certain dress, white, a little bit larger than usual, put a long hat on their head. These are forms, and these forms impress people, and they show that what they actually are not. <coughs> and Rumi says, after these point, I have not brought here, that a monkey, when he sees that somebody is praying, stands beside him and does like that. And he thinks that I am doing like him. Why thousands of miles is different from what the monkey is doing and what the man of God is doing. Now, I want to read a sonnet by Rumi to show you how the same meaning may have different the other the opposite of the story of parrots. In parrots, uh, <coughs> the form was the same. The form was the same. The meanings are different. Sometimes there are many many forms, very similar, but with different meanings. But the opposite is that there, that there are different forms, but they all have one meaning. So that is the, the, the idea of diversity. You have to be able to accept diversity, go deep into the meaning, and then see that this form and that form and that form, although they seem different, but they are the same. So Rumi is calling his friends morn arising friends early risers who is there that discovered the dawn who discovered us dancing in confusion like atoms who has the luck to come to the brink of a river to drink water from the river and to discover the reflection of the moon Somebody goes to the river, he wants to take some water, but suddenly he sees the moon in the water. The moon is a symbol of the Lord, of God. And, and he has to, he gets the idea, oh, there is a moon. You see, so who is so lucky as to, when he is going to do something very ordinary, he suddenly happens to see what he has to search for the moon. Who is there like a jackal, Yahu, from the shirt of Joseph, seeks the scent of his son. He asked to bring him the shirt of his son so that he would smell. He smelled and then his eyes was returned, his sight was returned. You see, it often happened that you go for some ordinary, to do some very ordinary thing, and then something great happens to you. This is a great luck. Or a thirst like the Bedouin cast a bucket into the well, and in the bucket discover the beauty like an ass load of sugar. You know, the remem you remember the story of Joseph in the Quran that uh, when the brothers throw him in the well. Some Bedouins in a caravan, they are passing by, so they sent down 
and they pay in order to get some water. And instead of water, they brought up Joseph. How what a great luck that you want to get some water and then some Joseph, the most beautiful, comes out of the, of the well. Or like Moses, you see, there are different things, but they all gives a tiding, gives of a miracle, a miracle of grace of God. God's grace may come at every moment in every form. Or like Moses seeking fire, who seeks out a bush, comes to gather the fire, according to the Quran, when Moses saw the fire, he said to his child, to his wife, that let me go to the fire and bring you some um, flame so that you would become warm. But he went there and he saw the light of God. God was speaking from the fire. Sometimes you go to the fire and you see the light. Or like Moses seeking fire who seeks out a bush, comes to gather the fire and discovers hundred dooms and sunrises. Jesus leaps into the house to escape from the, the, the foe. Suddenly from the house, he discovers the passage to heaven. God, he just running away from his foes into a small house. And from there, suddenly God brought him up to heaven. Or like a Solomon, he split a fish. This is about Iranian's custom when they have, during no rules, they, they traditionally, the traditional food for the night of no rules, the New Year's Day, is mahi, is fish. Why? Because in the, in the, in the belly of the fish, there is a ring of Solomon. You have lost the, the in the hope of in the hope of regetting and refining and regaining our lost ring. We try to open the spiritual world. People who go fishing finally they become fish, according to a poem in English. Let me see by Shelley. If you go constantly go for fishing. Finally, you become a fish and you go to the sea. Sword in hand, Omar, the friend of Muhammad, Omar, the second caliph, comes intending to slay the prophet. He said, I'll go and kill this man. He came there and he was devoted and he was attracted and he lost all his heart and he was one of the friends to the end of Muhammad. Sword in hand, Omar comes intending to slay the prophet. He falls into God's snare and discovers the kindly regard from both fortune. Or like Adam the son. See, this is the art of Rumi. He has so many images at hand. He is never short for any for creating any new image for the same idea. And these are allusions. You know, allusion in poetry is one of the figures of a speech, but it is more important than a figure of a speech. I'll explain a little bit about um, similarity and metaphor. People think that well, similarity or simile or metaphor or metonymy, they are something very simple. Because you say, Okay, her face is like a rose. Her eyes are shining like a star. This is simile. Or sometimes you say her, her two stars, instead of saying like, you directly say the rose came, meaning my rose-faced fair mistress. This is metaphor. Metaphor is when you don't say this is like that. You say this and you mean that. Uh, 
for life, I will finish this, for life at hand son, he drives toward the deer to make the deer his prey, and instead discovers another prey. He was himself a prey to the, to the deer, because he was going to prey the deer. The deer turned back and said, have you been created to follow me and to kill me? Is that the end of your creation? He thought for a moment, and then he stopped. And he was uh, uh, the prey of some great, great idea. Or like the thirsty oyster shell, he comes with gaping mouth. When you open the mouth in order to get some water, suddenly pearl, instead of a drop of water, you get the pearl. So Rumi <coughs> constantly plays with images. And these images are of great service in literature. Some people think that this is just some ornament for literature. You are saying something and then sometimes uh, in order to bring some charm to a poetry, you say, you assimilate or you compare two things together. It is not that. Simile and metaphor and metonymy and allusion, it means identity. Sometimes you say A is B. You don't know. You see A, but you don't see B. I want, I put them together. This is an equation. X is equal to 4. See, X is something different. But when there is equation, you come to know that x is equal to 5, x is equal to 3, y or y is equal to 3. This is an uh, equation. The equation of literature is as important as the equations in mathematics. The poet, as William Blake says, and Rumi says, and all great poets have said, first has to ascend to heaven and to contemplate things which no one has ever seen. He comes to a new consciousness and he is eager, he is desperate actually to communicate himself and to make people conscious, to make people aware, to give the news to people that I have been in such and such place. Like a person who has come from uh, an exotic country, everybody, everybody wants, he wants to explain that I have been to such and such country. The people were like that. The poet first goes to heaven and he contemplates the angels, the eternal forms, the eternal truths. And then when he comes back, he thinks, what can I say? It is these facts, these truths are inutterable, ineffable. Ineffability is one of the characteristics of mystical experiences. One is it is ineffable unless you just employ some image. Actually, one of the great poets of, I think it is uh, W. Yeats, or maybe Eliot, I'm not sure, that the, the main job, the main task of a poet is to find an image or a collection of images in order to communicate. He, he sees something, some similarity between his own experiences and these images. So he offers these images in the hope that people would be involved in these forms and finally get something, some idea of what he has said. I remember how ignorant was the prince who said to Mozart when Mozart was playing a piece of music. When it was finished, he said, how was it? He said, well, too many notes. <laughs> too many notes. Mozart said, one single note you cannot add, one single note you cannot omit. Because it is inevitable. Literature and poetry 
and music and all good art comes to a level when it is inevitable. You don't want to make any change. Everybody wants to keep it as it is. This is, Quran is inevitable. Rumi is in many cases inevitable. You cannot find, if you search and search and search, you cannot find a better word. It, even the best man of letter cannot change one single word of that piece which has risen to the level of, uh, you could say, sublime. In literature, they call it sublime. Sublime is when you arrive to the, uh, you have access to the eternal form, and that form, without any thought, pure and clear, comes to your mind. This is the melody. In poetry, melody is the meaning. Some great meaning, some great truth comes to the heart of Morana, to, to the heart of Rumi. He finds that God is jealous, for example. God is more jealous than you. And his jealousy is very serious because if he finds you with someone else, he will get it from you. He will uh, deprive you. And you may ask why he, is, he, he does not do a good job because we, we want our mistress, we want our friends. How is it that he, if he finds us with someone else? But someone else means someone who is not a man of God, who is not a good person. If you are with a good person, you are with God. If you are with your mistress for the sake of beauty, for the sake of goodness, for the, on the basis of justice, then you are with God. So God is not jealous with you. So this idea, when it comes to the mind of the poet, then he tries to give it a form. And, and he, what is the rhythm then? The rhythm is because the idea is so full of joy. The idea is so delightening, delightful, that you have to dance. So you have to give it a, a rhythm. And that rhythm, is light and lively and gay. It is not um, a, a gloomy. Of course, we don't have any gloomy rhythm because all rhythms um, are happy. The people say, is that the sad part of the music or the happy part? Uh, all is happy part. There is no sad part of music. Music is all happiness. It comes from the, the realm of hope the realm of beauty, the realm of delight, the realm of happiness. True music, like Handel, for example, is, is coming from paradise. So, rhythm may be more lively, more, you may contemplate, sometimes it is more uh, for good for contemplation, sometimes good for dancing. Uh, when it is very slow, it's one, two, three, Oh, you have time to think about it. See, you are moving, but you are happy. You don't lose any hope. We don't have any sad mood in music. So all the music, even the poetry of uh, Nasser Khosrow, somebody asked me, how is it that people don't like Nasser Khosrow as much as Hafiz? And I said, partly it is because of the rhythm. Rhythm is heavy is contemplative. It is not lively and jolly as it is that of Rumi. I have changed uh, some of the rhythms of Rumi into certain forms in painting. I'll show you. Uh, you see, since they turn round and round, this is one, uh, one of the rhythms. Actually, three forms of poetry can come into this uh, Circle. You see, it is like this. A O Shavan, A O Shavan, M Rules, Ma E Mo Shama. You see, dum dum da dum 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 da dum 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 da dum 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 da dum. See, A So Ravan O Is Deran Kaoran Mejong Nam Me Grava. Dum dum da dum. You can dance with it, but if you start from here, 
Da dum 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 da dum dum dum. You put two pairs. Da dum 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 da dum dum dum. بیا تا گل برفشانی همه در ساقر اندازیم so they are all full of joy, full of delight and uh, no one more than Rumi has created forms he has almost used all the forms um, I mean all the rhythms he has uh, as a heritage of Persian literature he has got but he has added he has added some new rhythms. I will explain when next in my next lecture uh, how what are the rhythms created by Rumi. One actually is created by Sadi, which is perfect, most beautiful, and Rumi has used it but has not made a great job of it. Sadi is more famous in that rhythm. So the in literature, music, if it is, if it is compared to music, the melody is the meaning, the rhythm is the mood, your happy, your thoughtful mood, and the harmony is the figures of speech. Many of the figures of speech are the harmony, because people who do not get the idea, get the meaning, and then create the form. They change this word with that word, and then they say he is a great, he has a good ear for sounds, and he has a good eye for the words, and alliteration, and assonance, and uh, dissonance, and things like that. They, are, they try to give it some impetus, give it some charm, while there is no meaning. And they don't see that none of their poetry has become popular. People don't read them. Rumi has created so many uh, memorable phrases. They are very beautiful, memorable phrases. And that even people who do not are illiterate, they can recite it. Shakespeare has given the most popular quotations to English people. There are so many that some people think that Shakespeare um, has not done a great job. He has just connected some popular quotations and turned them into plays. But uh, so the third part I want to linger a little bit on, on the third one which is uh, uh, the harmony, the harmony of the music. I will read two or three pieces, um, if we have time, of course. Let me read this first. I am a painter, a picture maker. Every moment I fashion an idol, then before you, I melt away all the idols. You see, every moment you see the mistress and you make a painting and you say, no, it is not he, it is not she. And then you destroy it. Because you, you yourself understand that this is not a mirror before your mistress. I raise up a hundred images and mingle them with the spirit. When I see your image, I cast them in the fire. You are the winter winter saki, or the enemy of the sober, or the one who lays waste every house I build. Whatever house I build for myself to live in, you destroy it, you make it ruin. And this last piece um, uh, is again about the different forms of happiness. Do not grieve ever any joy that has gone forever. If people are constantly uh, sorrowful about the joys they have had once a time, once upon a time, said, well, we were young and we could do this and do that, and what a good time it was. What Rumi said, never uh, grieve 
over any joy that has gone forever, for it will return to you in another form. Know that for sure. Did not the child find joy in its nursing and, its, and in milk? When the child was weaned from milk, the joy came from wine and honey. This joy is an unqualified thing. The meaning is unqualified, has no color, no form, nothing at all. But it can come to every quantity, every quality, every form, every color. The joy is unqualified thing, which enters various forms, moves from box to box, between water and clay. It suddenly displays its grace in the water of the rain, again enters into the rose bed and lifts its head from the earth. He just rises. If you look at the flower, you suddenly see that, well, he has come up to tell you something. Say, hello, how are you? I am the same joy you once used to have. Uh, this is a new form of that. So there is a verse in the Quran that God's at war means diversity and um, plurality of form is infinite. Every moment he has a new form. So you will never get bored with it. Every moment you will see him in a new form. He is ever fresh. Every time, every new time you think about him, something new happens to you. It is not an old God. It is true that English people say God is a good gentleman, an old gentleman. But he is not old. He is young. And every moment, just like a young boy, shows a new face, a shiny morning face. 